I'm Sarah Williamson, and this is Going Long with FCLT Global. On this show, you'll learn what it means to be long-term from the top minds in global business and investing. Leaders from companies and investment organizations join us to discuss how they are leading their teams for the long run on issues including capital allocation, risk management, climate change, and sustainability. To learn more, visit our website at fcltglobal.org. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast with FCLT Global. Today, our guest is Kareen smith Ihnacho. She is the Chief Governance and Compliance Officer at Norwich's Bank Investment Management, the asset management organization responsible for managing Norway's government pension fund global, one of the world's largest sovereign wealth funds. A seasoned corporate governance and compliance professional with over 20 years of experience working in the financial and oil and gas sectors, she's responsible for overseeing ownership and responsible investment activities, control and operational risk, compliance, and legal services. Prior to joining Norge's bank, she held senior legal and compliance roles at Stat Oil ASA and has also worked in private law firms. So, Kareem, welcome. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much, Sarah. Great to be here. So, could we start with having you tell us a little bit more about NBIM? What is what is different about Norge's bank investment management than than some other large scale investors uh, that people may be familiar with? Well, first of all, we are a sovereign wealth fund, and I think that makes us quite different. I mean, we, by being a sovereign wealth fund, we only actually have one owner, which is the Norwegian state. Or some say we have 5 million owners, uh, which is the Norwegian people. But anyway, so we don't take money from individuals or professional clients, and which means we don't need to spend time selling products but we can focus solely on managing the fund. And that takes me to the, I think the second thing that makes us different is that we are a true generational fund. We were set up to be a fund for future generations. And the whole point of the fund was really to transfer the state's income from uh, oil and gas that were found outside of Norway to financial wealth that can benefit not only the generation that found oil, but all future generations of Norwegians. So every year, only a tiny bit of the fund is taken out, taken out to top up the national budget so that the fund, at least in theory, can last for forever. But, but just to say that tiny bit that's taken out of the fund every year actually amounts to 20 or 25% of the national budget. So it means that the fund, in a way, pays for every fifth teacher or nurse or uh, fifth uh, road that's being built in Norway. And that's how, you know, the fund really can benefit people in Norway today, but also uh, the, for the future. So, so finally, I want to say, you know, being a fund owned by the people of Norway, we actually have in our mandate that we should manage the fund in a responsible manner, also transparency and at low cost. And I think maybe that makes uh, our mandate slightly different than other large uh, institutional funds. It does make it different. It's it's inherently long-term when you talk about the next generation or following all future generations of Norwegians. It's obviously very um, large, which gives you um, a big responsibility and a big presence um, in the in the market. Um, when you say that um, Norges wants to invest responsibly, um, can you tell us what that means? How do you what what does that what that means? Different things to different people. What does that mean to you? Yeah, I think to say it very simple for us, it means good investment management. I think it means looking after the risk and also the opportunities. That's being caused by the sustainability challenges faced by the many companies in our portfolio. So it's about addressing what we call key ESG issues, good corporate governance, environmental and social issues. And I think the reason that's why that is so important to us is because we are a long-term and global investor. So you know, we invested in more than 9,000 companies in more than 70 countries. So we always say we own a small part of the world's economy. So 
how the world economy is doing will affect the returns of the fund. So let me just take the climate as an example, you know, to the extreme. If um, the world becomes uninhabitable, the fund is not mer- worth much. But even to the, you know, not, not so extreme, all analysis show that it's better for the world economy to have an orderly transition to net zero. And that's why, again, we say to the companies in our portfolio, they should have net zero 2050 goals. So in the end, for us, uh, we believe being a responsible investor really is about improving our long-term returns. And how has that changed over time? Um, uh, Obviously, the fund has grown, has evolved. The thinking has evolved. You've done, um, you and your team have done a lot of work on some of these issues. So what what do you, as you think about the, the key issues or the key trends driving your thinking today, what, what would you highlight? Yeah. I mean, how we work as an active owner has really changed over time. I mean, I've been with the fund now almost six years and it's been a tremendous change even those years. But if you look even further back, we can see more changes. And it was interesting because a few years ago, we wrote a book about uh, our 20 years history as a responsible owner. And, you know, the title of the book was, uh, it was from a reluctant owner to an active owner. And the whole point of that title was that we have totally changed our approach to responsible investment from 20 years ago and until today. And so this has really been a journey where, where it has evolved over time. And, and you know, for, in the beginning, for us being a responsible owner was more about which companies we should not be invested in, which companies we should exclude from our investment universe. So yeah. early on, we set up this council on ethics that recommended companies for exclusion, e- either if they're involved in certain products such as coal and tobacco or certain conduct such as gross human rights abuses. But otherwise, we were not that active owner. Uh, and as a great example, we didn't even vote at the companies we had invested in, which today seems really strange. But then this approach changed over time. I think there was a few reasons for that, but not the least that we became bigger and bigger and had a larger uh, ownership stake in the companies and realized, gosh, you know, as a large long-term shareholder, we really has an interest in how these companies were run and we need to pursue our rights as a shareholders. So it started with using our voting rights in 1996. We voted for the first time at the AGM of HSBC. And then it has evolved from there. And today we are very active on there. I mean, last year we had 3,000 company meetings and voted on 120,000 resolutions. So yeah, it's been quite a change. That's quite a change. And you you must have built the the team and the staff to do that over time, the ability to do it. So you make your own decisions. You meet with these companies directly and you make your own decisions about how to vote, which I think is um, uh, is is not always understood. So I, I think that's an important thing for, for, for people to understand too. Great. So um, when you think about engaging with companies, so sometimes you're voting, sometimes you're divesting if it's something that you, that's really um, uh, offensive in some way, but in general, you're really engaging with companies and how do they respond to that? So do they, um, do you think that companies appreciate it? Do they change their practices? Um, how, how does that dialogue work? Yeah. I think it varies a lot whether they appreciate it or not, but I think most companies do. And engagement is really a number one tool when it comes to responsible investment. You know, we engage to promote good corporate governance, sustainable business models, and also in general, responsible business practices. And um, as I said, we had around 3,000 companies meetings last year. And Lots of the meetings are with uh, company boards. They can be with executive management. Also sometimes with experts uh, in the companies. Sometimes it's we, con- we contact the company. Sometimes they reach out 
to us. In particular, before the AGM, we see it's a lot of outreach from the companies to go through the proxies and convince it, us to vote one way or the other. But I think in, in general, companies like that uh, we are an active owner, that we are clear on our views and expectations as an owner, and also that we are responsive to outreach and that we want to discuss uh, discuss uh, important issues with with the companies. So I think in general, I find that we have very good relationship with the companies we we are, are invested in. And for us, it is important to be a good owner, which means a predictable owner, and uh, it means that we are easy to get hold of. And do you see the um, do you see the companies changing? Um, are there Examples or, or ways that you've seen companies adopt more responsible business practices. Um, you probably can't say because of your interaction, but um, alongside some of this um, increased um, interaction over time. You know, in many ways, the point of being an active owner is that we want to have influence and see changes in the company we are investing. And do we see that people often ask, you know, is it worth all your work? How, how can you see you actually have an impact uh, that they listen to you? And it is not easy to measure, measure this, but we absolutely uh, do try and we sit on a lot of data. And give me, uh, just to give an example, um, when we start having specific dialogues with the companies, we very much set specific objects for the changes we would like to see. Uh, and we communicate those clear to the companies and we track progress over time. So, so just to take uh, an example, we started last year, we started something called Net Zero Dialogue. Uh, our objective then was, uh, as, as you can tell from the name of it, uh, it was for the companies to set a Net Zero target by 2050 and implement the uh, credible transition plans. And that is measurable. You know, we can see how, you know, we contacted X number of companies, Y number of companies had done what we asked them to do at the end of uh, that uh, dialogue. And similarly, we do that for many of the dialogues we, we start, uh, set the range of KPIs and measure progress against it. Then of course, uh, even the receipt changes, it may be because of us, or it may be just, uh, you know, driven by other, by other reasons, you know, changes in the marketplace, etc. We need to be careful and do not claim that the changes we see was because of us. But, you know, what we do see is that the companies we engage with in, in general, improve more than the rest of the companies in our portfolio. And I think for us, uh, who works with, uh, you know, active ownership, uh, that's really encouraging to see. I think that's a great model of really building, you know, uh, um, objectives, uh, building a, a team that can interact, having those KPIs, tracking it over time. Um, and I, I liked your word about being predictable, which is, you know, it's not it's not one issue today and another issue tomorrow. It's um, you, you've got a, a long term plan. Um, one of the areas that's important these days is executive compensation or remuneration, and um, you all have written about that. Um, that has become um, it's very different in different countries. It's become more. Um, uh, center stage, if you will, uh, recently. Can you talk a little bit about how you think about um, a, a engaging and in, in your and in your thoughts on um, executive compensation today? Yeah, I mean, our views on executive compensation and in particular for the CEO is very simple. We want the CEO to have a simple and transparent pay package where substantial proportion of the total annual pay is provided as shares. And with those shares, we want them to be locked for a minimum of five years, preferably 10, regardless of resignations, 
or retirement. So they should even be locked up even after the CEO has resigned. And in this way, we think there's full alignment between the CEO interest and the shareholders interest. So if the stocks go up, we do well and so does the CEO. And also having a, a long holding period ensures compensation yeah. is driven by long-term value creations. And then we also believe that the share should not have very complex performance uh, conditions attached to them. You know, you need to understand in a way the total outcome on a pay package. We often see it's very complex. Uh, and uh, so we don't, in the end, know what the total outcome may be. So we want simplicity and transparency. And, you know, we also say we want reasonable outcome. What does that mean? You know, we don't have a, a set number, but what we have seen is that the CEO salaries, in particular in the US, have been spiraling upwards and we have been quite clear that we believe they have become too high and not always aligned with good performance. And that's why we said also come out and said we will tighten up the voting practice on high, the high pay package. And uh, in particular those that are potentially dilutive and unusually costly compared to performance. So it's really alignment transparency, simplicity, and I don't know, this is my word, not yours, reasonableness, something that's just, uh, just, just seems to, to, to make sense. Okay. That's very, that's very helpful. And how, um, how common is it for companies to have that long lockup? Because it is very compelling. And if you sort of think of, um, a family company or a company that has a founder, maybe they're maybe. locked up um, legally or maybe they're not, but they have that long-term ownership. But it's very common in um, traditional CEOs for them to um, leave the firm and get rid of their stock. So how how how, how common is that, 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 that they've got that post-retirement or post-resignation um, skin in the game still? No, no, it's not that common. And we very much, uh, you know, understand that our view uh, is not uh, always aligned with or not really much aligned with uh, what we see as market practice. Although what we do see in some markets, the holding period is getting longer and longer. But uh, I think typically in the US, for instance, it seems that uh, normal vesting period is three years. So we don't vote against pay packages that are, um, you know, three three years uh, because that's that's market practice. But we do try to convey our views that we think it's too short, and it would be preferable if it was longer. And uh, maybe then the CEO would think somewhat more longer term on certain decisions. And at least that's much more aligned with us as a long term fund. Right. We, yeah. No, and I think it's I think it's so compelling to to have that clarity. I think compensation is is a space where there's just um, complexity for the sake of complexity. So thank you for that. Um, so as you think about e whether it's climate or whether it's compensation or whether it's you know some of the other issues that you deal with. Um, you know, what are some of the obstacles you, you, you face? It seems, um, you know, you have, you have a very strong team, you have very clear objectives, um, you make it look easy, but I'm sure it's not. So tell us about some of the obstacles. Yeah, it's not easy at all. Many obstacles, challenges, but I think that's what makes this uh, so exciting. Uh, I think um, one of the main challenge we see in the whole responsible investment space is lack of data. It has very much improved, but we still simply don't know how the companies are doing when it comes to sustainability. I mean, the reporting has increased dramatically, become a lot better, but still it's a long way uh, to go for many companies to really, you know, tell us. You, you know, your main um, risks and opportunities when it comes to sustainability, because then we can t 
take the right ownership decisions and not the least the right investment decisions. So, so lack of data is still one. And I think another main challenge uh, is actually at the, at the very much at the heart of the work you do, Sarah, is the balancing of interest between short term and long term. And of course, a lot what we hear when we are in the dialogues with company is that it's hard to think, you know, what the company is going to do in 2050 when they need to tackle short term challenges such as inflation, uh, supply chain, cost, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, as a long-term investor, we really also need to know where the company is going to be in the longer term. And I think that's why, yeah, the work you do, Sarah, is is so important that, that companies don't lose track of the longer-term perspective. Um, I would also say, now what we see in the whole ESG space uh, is, of course, the ESG backlash. And for us, that is very much a concern because, as I said in the beginning, for us, it's about long-term risk management and not politics. So again, we hope uh, this backlash doesn't stop the companies for, for, from addressing uh, that important risk and also reporting on it. And finally, I think I should say, um, and finally this challenge is as much as we work hard to be a responsible investor, work with climate, uh, work on other ESG issues. I think uh, there sometimes is this view that inve investors should fix all society problems. And some issues just can't be solved by responsible investment, but need, you know, government action, policy actions. And uh, so I think there is a limit to what a financial investor can do. And I think that also needs to be appreciated. Hey, well, you're in a fascinating position because I'm sure there are people um, on one end who say you're not doing enough. And then there are other people on the other end who say you're doing too much. Um, so, so perhaps that means you're you're more or less in the right space. Um, on the metric side, I know you've been very involved with ISSB, um, and many of our um, listeners know a lot about ISSB. But do you, you do you want to take just one minute to to sort of give a quick summary of that and and if and how you think that that may be. Um, one solution to the to the metrics issue? Yes. I think what's happened with the ISSB and the work they're, they're doing is fantastic. Because as an investor, what we have for a long time said, is like we need a global standard that's comparable across industries, across timelines. And that is exactly what ISSB is doing. And we also very much like that it's uh, based upon the uh, sector framework developed by SASB. Uh, I know it's a lot of acronyms here, but we, we think that's, that's uh, great. And we have been um, a big supporter of the SASB framework for a long time. We actually even went out publicly and said that's the framework we think companies should uh, report against because it shows what the material risks are uh, from a financial perspective. There's a we have huge, huge support of this consolidation of framework, reporting framework we now see uh, coming together in ISSB and just, uh, you know, on the sideline chairing as much as we can uh, for the work and not just on the sideline even, I'm actually you know, a vice chair of the uh, investor advisory group. And uh, now it's very pleased to see and also the, the progress they've had. So I think this is important for us as investors and uh, also it's going to make life easier for companies, I believe, with one, one global set of reporting standards. So I think as we look forward, having ISSB <laughs> be that central um, standard, maybe one global standard, or at least a a um, a, a real um, north star, if you will, for reporting is going to be um, 
so important and should both make investors' lives easier, but also make companies' lives easier, given the fact that right now companies are being bombarded with all sorts of questions. So um, obviously we're, we're um, hoping that that works uh, as well. Um, but besides the metrics, looking ahead, what do you see um, coming down in the, in the coming years? I know you all have been thinking about um, natural capital and biodiversity. You've also been thinking about ethical AI. I mean, so tell us a little bit about some of the issues that, um, you know, you are, are still on the drawing board that you're, you're, you think will be what we'll be talking about in the next few years. Yes, I think, I mean, the, despite the ESG backlash and measure, I think there's going to be great developments when it comes to responsible investment. I think it's here to stay and to grow. And as you said, one thing we have uh, been looking at is uh, very much natural capital and the link to climate. And we will engage more in that topic. And uh, recently, or, or maybe not so, a couple of years ago, actually, we published our expectation document ex on biodiversity. And we have engaged with that for some years, but we also stepped that up. And what we do see now is improvements in the market practice. I mean, such as the use of certification and stronger supply requirements to, to fight uh, deforestation, which is so important for the whole work on climate. And then um, another area we're looking now is uh, and developing new expectations is on consumer interest. And I think that's going to be extremely important going forward, not uh, the least issues around sale and marketing practices and companies use of personal data but sarah you mentioned also ethical ai i mean wow uh that's a difficult but very exciting topic i mean ai probably will change the world uh, but is it to the better or is it to the worse let let's hope to the better but i think you know with the lack of regulations that we have on ethical AI now I think he, the, this is an era where actually the investor can contribute and and try to set some sort of expectations to the companies on how they will use AI around you know transparency, explainability, uh, personal data use, etc. So we we actually now in the middle of developing ex, uh, our view on ethical use of AI. Definitely be something that will develop over time, but we're going to come out with a first cut in August sometime. And it's currently now on, we send it out for consultations to experts and we soon discuss it with some companies. So absolutely, uh, lots of things happening and, and much, uh, you know, many exciting uh, developments. Well, I think your contrast between where governments can really step in and where investors um, can push uh, is very interesting because, of course, you know governments do set policy and are and are me meant to do that. But investors like yourselves, um, but governments don't, you know, in general tend to be, um, uh, the, you know, as mo as up to date on technology as uh, as some other kinds of institutions, and find it very hard to um, regulate fast moving areas. Whereas investors are very interested in fast moving areas because. Um, that, that that is that is the future. So I think that um, having having you think that through and then have some um, uh, some some guidelines, policies, objectives um, around that will be, um, I think, very helpful for both governments and and also uh, their investors. Um, well, so with that, let's see. Got all sorts of interesting issues ranging from. Um, climate to compensation to um, biodiversity and natural capital. The consumer interest side is a fascinating one. The use of data is becoming extremely um, important. And then wherever um, AI takes us. So I don't think you're going to get bored in this role. And I think uh, that uh, we all we all recognize um, how important your leadership is in really pushing these issues and thinking about them, not in a political way, as you said, but in a way that um, aligns your 
objective to invest for future generations of Norwegians with the company's objectives, hopefully to to create um, that long-term value. So with that, I would just like to thank you. I would like to thank you for your leadership. Thank you uh, for at uh, Norges and all the other things that you're involved in. Um, and thank you for your insights today. Well, thank you, Sarah. It's been a pleasure to talk to you as always. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Going Long with FCLT Global. Be sure to hit subscribe to get new episodes every other Monday. To learn more, visit our website at fcltglobal.org.